I want to talk about the news environment and then specifically talk about uh, some research you you know of or that you can imagine, uh, what tools you might use, what theories you might pursue. Um, so let's start off with just the uh, the, tradi the gatekeeping function within news media. So what is the difference, uh, first off, what is the nature of gatekeeping in uh, traditional media? Who are the gatekeepers? Eh. This has a very sharp edge here, and I keep, I, I made myself bleed over here last week, and now I'm bleeding here. Uh, we're just, we're too close. Right? Okay. Um, so, traditional media, um, who are the gatekeepers? Media owners can be. How would the media owner gatekeep? Speak up. Day to day operation. How would an owner? Uh, act as a gatekeeper. Uh, that's one way. It's actually not very typical, unless it's a very small organization. Um, it's more likely, uh, and and on a daily basis, I'd say, done through who they hire. Uh, the owner doesn't typically work in the day-to-day -day operation, but they decide who's going to be the executive editor, the managing editor, the publisher. Um, if, if he's not the publisher, with the big with the big uh, media chains, for example, that is uh, very much um, the case. So, you know, McClatchy, for example, that I used to work for, is noted to being one of the more. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Consequently, <laughs> it's rare to find. I don't know that they have any any uh, news media that do not have liberal editors and publishers. I mean, that's you know that they they have a very I'd say overtly um, partisan. And so they're going to hire somebody that reflects their, their opinion. Uh, so that's more likely. Once in a year, I've you know one of the textbooks or something they complained as an example that that the owner owning uh, the owners of of a certain group of Canadian newspapers uh, dared to. Uh, publish their own editorial once a week. I just about laughed at that. I mean, they own it. An editorial is an opinion, and and there's nothing that says that the editors or the the publishers of that paper have to write have to be in charge of every opinion expressed by that newspaper. The owner ultimately has that prerogative, and so when they use that as their best example of corporate control or pro corporate interference. Like I said, I, I pretty much I pretty much laughed at that idea, because for the owner to only the only his, his only control in the whole newspaper is insist that he gets to write the editorial, the opinion piece once a week, is extraordinarily little. That's 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 not very much control. So if that's their best example of corporate control, they don't have very good examples. Um, I, I, and so I would say that my example of how they control is much more prevalent. They're going to hire who reflects their opinions. And then on a day-to-day -day basis, the publisher, the executive editor, the editor, you know, the different, they're going to um, do according to, you know, they're, they're aligned with his ideals. And so it comes fairly natural for them. So 
that was, I think I gave you the example when I was working at that daily paper uh, where uh, a family claimed that they were all made sick by, uh, by a, an airplane, what they call dusting in America. When a, when, a, when a small airplane spreads insecticide or um, other chemicals on a, an orchard, for example, um, <clears throat> that's called dusting. So this aircraft, small aircraft, dusted a, an orchard uh, with, uh, I think, a pesticide. And these people that were living two miles away, about three kilometers away, all claimed to get sick from it. Now, I'm not ruling out the possibility that it's true. My complaint, uh, as a member of the of the front page um, committee, uh, in deciding what would go on the front page, is that the story they had. In fact, they had they ran the story I think three times, different versions of it, follow up stories, and I don't believe they ever asked for the opinion of a scientist or a doctor. They they totally took the word of this family that they were all sick. Now, my brother happened to be a world-class agronomist who worked with pesticides. So when I told, asked him, you know, do you think this is feasible? This entire family got sick by dusting two miles away. He laughed at it. He said, there's no way they could be. Absolutely no way. It, it's just not possible. Now, again, he could be wrong. He's human. Even though he was one of the top agronomists in the world, um, he had uh, written, he wrote, wrote literally thousands of articles on, on his areas of expertise. That included the fact that the newspaper would not even ask their reporter to, to uh, interview somebody with scientific expertise was to me a sign that they were overly partisan, that they had committed themselves to certain environmentalism that, that defied fairness. Um, so, uh, in that case, the McClatchy news chain, which is noted to be liberal and therefore almost in, in America, death by definition, pro-environmentalism, um, controlled through their editor and their executive, their executive editor and managing editor, uh, that decision making to run articles without both sides of the story, um, even something that was you know, in fact, in our area, uh, Washington State University is one of the top agro uh, agricultural agronomy uh, universities in, in the world. That's where my brother got his uh, all of his degrees. So anyway, that's that's an indirect control through the owner, and that's much more likely to happen than them dictating something from above directly, uh, because they're busy with other stuff. So uh, McClatchy didn't have to dictate, oh, you're going to run that story on the front page. <laughs> uh, for one thing, they, you know, the chain is, is situated about mm, 600 miles from the newspaper I was at. They, they own a number of different newspapers, and they're about 600 miles away. They don't have time to mess with that. So they, the, the owners, and particularly in that situation in chains, would not be involved in day-to-day decision-making like that. Uh, so obviously by what I said, the decision makers are more likely to be uh, the people on, you know, at uh, on the front line, so to speak. Uh, starting with the the uh, editor, the executive editor, the managing editor, they, they may have different titles. You may just have an editor, and there may only be one editor or one top editor, not not counting copy editors and some of the functional editors. Um, in our newspaper. Like I said, there was about 50 people in the staff altogether, and there was an executive editor and a managing editor. Then there was a metro editor handling, you know, overseeing the news, the the uh, uh, reporting, the local reporting staff, which was most of the reporting staff. So let's go down to him. How would the metro editor, who who op, who oversees the work um, of the newspaper or the reporters, how would he be a gatekeeper? I just mentioned some ways that the ex executive editor and managing editor were in, the, in choosing which stories would go on the front page. Um, 
But now even below them, like I say, the Metro editor overseeing the work of the of the uh, uh, reporting staff. So what kind of functions would they uh, would you anticipate they would have the Metro editor and his assistant in this case in our in our new staff? How would they get involved in, in gatekeeping? Don't be shy. Let's let's have some conversation here. You guys are mature enough. You should be able to converse on this. Uh, our first year students and second year students, maybe not. You guys are far enough along. You should be not shy about this stuff. So, coming from over here, I'm feeling guilty for not answering that question. Go ahead and answer. How would the man, the, the metro editor, in charge of the reporters? Over all the local reporters. So, so what's his function going to be there? If he's working with the reporters, what sort of things does he do with the reporters? Okay, so in some cases they would actually tell them. You know, you go do this story and choose the story for them. Um, that's not actually very, I mean, they, in a whole day's paper, they might have told one person which story to write. But more often, they organize it with beats. You've heard of news beats. And so they say, okay, you're in this beat, you're in that beat, you're in that beat, you're in that beat. Um, so in organizing them, they get to choose who, who's where. That might that selection, uh, also going back to hiring, the, the the owner is not the one hiring the reporters. He's the one hiring the editor and the, the executive editor and promoting people to those top positions. He doesn't control uh, the local newspaper uh, typically uh, in the selection of reporters or the assignment of reporters. So that would go back to the new staff so that the actual selection, the hiring of them would be executive editor, managing editor, very likely the metro editor. So those three editors would be involved in the general news reporting, not sports or something like that perhaps. But um, but for the general selection, so they could also prejudice in hiring. Uh, they could prejudice uh, the news coverage in their beat selection um, and their assignment of beats. For example, we had a nuclear reservation uh, in the uh, uh, real near to our uh, to our newspaper, uh, so they they if they hired an environmentalist uh, oriented reporter to go report uh, on the nuclear site, you could expect to get quite a few negative stories. If they hired a reporter to cover it uh, that was kind of pro industry, pro nuclear, you'd have a whole different type a, a set of stories. Uh, not just one time, but every day forever, basically, by who you chose. Um, and in fact, uh, I happened to be there while that transition took place because in the eight, in the 1980s, the Cold War was still going on, and the nuclear reservation was um, building uh, materials for nuclear bombs. They also were getting paid a lot of money. The engineers and people that worked in the nuclear reservation, on average, they probably average re, uh, being paid twice as much as other people in the community. So even though they might have represented, I don't remember exactly, uh, maybe 20% of the news news uh, or excuse me of the uh, employment in that city, they made up more than half. Uh, or about half of all the money that came into the into the uh, uh, local economy. So even though it was owned by a liberal organization, were they going to hurt themselves by being critical all the time of the biggest, you know, the biggest employer in the city? No, they weren't. Um, so even a very liberal organization. Is not going to hurt itself economically uh, by by being anti 
industry when it comes to the biggest industry in their in their city. They're not going to do it. Um, first off, their readers would start canceling their subscriptions. Their advertisers would start canceling their advertising. Um, they would, you know, they would be losing money hand over fist, and they might even have to end up selling the newspaper. Uh, besides the fact that they wouldn't be making as many, much profits. So, so even a, an organization that in many respects, when it comes to national news and stuff, is very pro-environmental, not when it affects their, their bottom line. Suddenly they become conservative. Um, but then, with the end of the Cold War, the nuclear reservation turned more to environmental cleanup. There had been a lot of nuclear material just thrown out in the middle of the desert, uh, not properly uh, uh, contained. Uh, there was some possibility that nuclear, uh, that, that radioactivity could reach the, the water that was, uh, you know, the underground uh, aquifers that uh, provided water for all the cities there. Now it became, yeah, now it could become very liberal because, um, uh, because now everybody was concerned about it. So, you know, the community pushed them into, uh, you know, help them change their orientation once it no longer, once building nuclear bombs was no longer part of their mission. Uh, and when their mission was almost 100% cleaning the mess up. But now they could certainly be in, you know, pro-environmental, and they were. Um, so going back to the Metro editor, um, so he's involved in hiring. He is invo involved in who's going to cover what uh, and selection of, of the people. Again, do you hire, you know, what sort of person do you want to uh, send to be the main reporter for a certain organization, such as a nuclear uh, reservation? Uh, also on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they do not typically tell them what to write because they, that's, uh, if you have, 30 reporters or something, you can't, you don't have time to do that. Um, so you have to trust your, your reporters to make some decisions. One thing they found uh, in research is that, and I think I told you this already, but I'll, I'll come back to it, is how reporters report depends a lot on how, you might say hard-nosed, how, um, how strong a management they have. And this is based in part, at least uh, by my interpretation of the, of the research, it's based in part in that writing is a social activity. In what way, why can I, why can I say that all writing is a social activity? Essentially, essentially all writing anyway. Why would that be true, or is it true? If they want to challenge me, they can challenge me. Why is writing a social activity, especially at a newspaper where you don't necessarily know your audience, you know some of your audience, but is it still a social activity if you're writing a news story and maybe you don't know, don't know any of your readers? Is it a social activity? You know, you're brand new to the city, you've just been given a job, um, so how is it a social activity? You don't know one reader. That's not very likely to be true very long, but for our, you know, for purposes of argument, that's the case in our scenario. Is it still a social activity? When you write something, are you thinking of somebody? Is there ever a time when you write something you don't think of somebody? It might be your instructor. It might be who you're writing to, obviously, your mother, your friend, whatever. Is there ever a case where you're not, where you're not thinking of somebody when you're writing? Maybe note taking, I guess. You're taking notes. But even then, you're kind of thinking of, gee, I wonder what the professor's thinking. What note should I take? So you still have the professor in mind. And you're trying to outsmart the professor taking notes that you think are important to you. So you're still thinking of somebody. So writing is by its very nature a social activity. 
And what they found in this research was that if if the editors were uh, really uh, strongly urged and required their reporters to, uh, for example, to be unbiased, you know, to be fair in their coverage, they were because they were thinking of the editors. If the editors were weak, then they found that the editors were thinking of the audience and sometimes it's a pretend audience. They were thinking, I think I did tell you this before, but I'll do it again to make my point. They were thinking of that damsel in distress. I'm coming to save them. Here I come. I'm going to save the community. I'm going to save that, you know, whoever. Okay, so they suddenly were the white knights in armor with their swords and, and so forth. Um, and that's kind of how they saw themselves. I think we have a lot of those in America right now. A lot of those who have very little control over them and they are, uh, when it comes to fairness and, un and, and unbiased reporting, yeah, not so much. Because they're out there to conquer evil from their perspective. And of course, evil from their perspective does not mean it's evil by everybody's perspective. And so they get they they start orienting and framing their news from a very biased perspective. So um, the gatekeepers in that case, if you don't have strong management, strong editorial management, then the reporters themselves become the gatekeepers. Um, and, and in many cases, they are to some degree anyway. But I remember I went to an IRE um, a conference many years ago in Washington, D.C., and they had a panel, and I say most newspapers in America are considered, by American standards, liberal. And again, if you want to understand what that means in America, we can go into that. But uh, I think I've told you before, I personally am conservative in America, but I'm liberal in Kazakhstan. It's all a matter of a comparison. I'm very pro um, freedom of speech and and, and uh, uh, press and and so forth, religion, and so in Kazakhstan they violate most of those freedoms. So I am a liberal, wanting change in Kazakhstan. Um, I am a conservative in America. Those things already, in fact, if anything, those who are trying to squelch freedom of speech and gathering and press and so forth are the liberals in America right now for some reason. And we it's flipped in some way. And so while they're called liberals, they're not. Uh, when conservatives try to go on a university campus, there are sometimes riots to stop them from talking. Uh, they don't even want them to show up and be able to present their, their opinions at all. And they're blocking them. They're turning their starting fires to stop them from, from speaking on campuses. They're turning over cars to keep them from speaking on campuses. Um, uh, and others that are not part of that uh, are are doing similar things uh, off the campus. So right now, the liberals in America are those who are anti-free speech and free press, which is almost by defies definition as being liberal, uh, which is a sad thing. Um, so uh, there, you know, it's flipped. What, who's a liberal and who's a conservative in America is very screwed up right now. Uh, so in, going back then, um, at this uh, conference that I was at, they had uh, mostly liberal editors on, on this panel, but they did accidentally invite one conservative. And so the conservative kind of pinned it on these other editors and said, how do you uh, prevent your reporters from biasing their, their story selection? So it was uh, directly about gatekeeping. And the, I remember it was the New York Times editor in the Washington Bureau, the Washington, D.C. Bureau, who said, that's hard because most of our reporters are liberal by their definition. Uh, and so uh, they would much rather write a story about waste, you know, financial waste in the military than, than they would about financial waste in welfare services. And so he admitted that only a tough, a fairly, you know, hands-on, tough editor could keep them from biasing the new selection, the gatekeeping, at a reporter level. Um, 
So all of these, you see, you know, gatekeeping functions throughout the organization from the owner all the way down to the reporter. And then also back up again, the reporters give their stories to the Metro editor or whoever their lead editor in a bigger organization, they'd have more uh, editors to report to. There'd be the reporters would have more people to report to. So with the Washington uh, Post or the New York Times, uh, I think I mentioned the Washington Post peaked out at 900 employees in their newsroom. Well, you obviously didn't have just one Metro editor overlooking, you know, overseeing all of your, all of your reporters. You had lots of different editors with different assignments. So, uh, but in each case, the reporters would bring their story to their editor, whoever they're assigned to report to, and that editor would give them feedback. And some of that would be, uh, we're not running this till you do such and such. So he could send them back to, you know, in the case if he's a if he's a fair-minded, traditional editor, he would say, you only got one side of the story, you need to get the other side. Uh, you haven't written this, you've, you've been biased in your reporting. There's not enough of those editors in America right now, um, but that's what he would do. If he happens to have a bias himself, then he's going to be fostering some very biased reporting uh, by his neglect of, of upholding supposedly the standards of American journalism, which are no longer standards of American journalism. Um, then, uh, of course, it goes back up again. I mentioned the front page meeting, so it goes up and, and those um, uh, stories get passed up and they ultimately they might they would come to, to the copy editors. The copy editors uh, have the right to do some rewriting if they think it sounds biased. They and they can even kick it back and they they don't they can't overrule the the Metro editor in the case of my newspaper. Uh, my, the daily newspaper I was part of. Uh, in that sense, they couldn't overrule, but they could rewrite the story and make it sound less biased or more biased if they had a bias. Um, they could they control the final product as it goes out, uh, the, the form in which it goes out. They control the headline. The copy editors write the headlines, so they could bias or make the headline, you know, slanted one way or the other in their in their gatekeeping function. Uh, they also decide where does it go on a page. So when I was doing the front page of the paper, um, you know, I was given six stories. It is a gatekeeping function for me to decide, okay, I can put one story up here. We'll call that one. We'll call uh, maybe one at the bottom, um, six. Uh, maybe... Uh, one in here is year two, and one in maybe one down here. They can go all the way down. Um, a three, and maybe this one goes this way. Whatever, you get the idea. Maybe we have a four or five down here. Um, so, who, who decides how to lay that page out? Well, if it's given to me to be to do the front page, I do. So I write the headlines, and I choose where to put it. So. If I don't like a story, it's going down here with a smaller headline and with smaller space. If I like the story, it's going up here. I'm acting as a gatekeeper. Now, I was assigned those stories, so I can't kick them out, but I can give different emphasis to them. Uh, and, and like I said, I write the headline. The headline can emphasize something very different between depending what my biases are. What am I focusing on in that, in that story? Is it something that is uh, goes against the local congressman, uh, or is it you know? So I do I emphasize the negative? The, let's say it's a fair story, and there's a pro and a con. Which am I, which one am I emphasizing that story? The one that favors the local congressman, or the one that attacks the local congressman. Uh, that as a copy editor handling that page, I get to decide. Now, I could be overridden by, by my superior, but I'm the one, at least I'm creating, I'm desktop publishing it. I'm putting it out, ready to go to print, and I give it to somebody else, and they have to make a last minute decision whether they think it's okay or whether they want to change it. And they are, they're feeling the pressure of a deadline too, so they're probably not going to change it unless they really feel strongly about it. 
And so I'm probably going to get my will on this thing as the copy editor doing that page. Um, so one of the things that I think there's a couple of elements of, of gatekeeping that you need to understand. There are a lot of people involved in gatekeeping, especially when you're talking about a daily newspaper, even one that's a small, um, the one I was at was considered a medium sized paper. Okay, about 50 in journalists. Well, how does that compare to the Washington Post with 900 journalists? You know, now you have 900 gatekeeping people that have some gatekeeping capability from reporter to, to owner. All the way up and down, you have gatekeepers. Um, and so actually my, my belief is that the biggest, uh, the idea that, that the owner is controlling everything, well, not on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know of any large newspaper where the owner is controlling things on a day-to-day -day basis other than the one decision. Who do I hire as editor? You know, that decision or publisher, you know, the, the top the top people in that newspaper. The owner gets to decide who the top people are. And then it goes on down. Top people get to get, you know, get to decide who the uh, lower editors are and who the and then the lower editors help decide who the reporters are going to be and so forth. So uh, when it really comes down to it, the biggest effect in gatekeeping is is really uh, the the orientation um, in hiring is that a hiring is ultimately the biggest gatekeeping decision uh, that people make in a daily newspaper, um, and it starts. It's still it's still not one person. It's not just the owner, but it filters down from the owner. If he if he's biased in a certain way, he chooses editors that share his bias who who uh, uh, choose uh, lower editors who share their bias who choose reporters who share their bias. Um, in some areas, it doesn't really matter. It depends what the issues are. If the issue is uh, city council, you know, your city council coverage, it's hard to tell who a liberal and conservative is. Um, conservatives are going to be more anti-tax. And so they're going to want lower tax rates. The local liberals are going to want more services. Uh, but it's they intermesh a lot. They, they, it's what they are on a national level is not necessarily what they are on a local level. For one thing, the U.S. Constitution, uh, in the case of America, uh, the whole idea of the U.S. Constitution was that the federal government would be very small and have very few powers, and that most of the active government activity would be at the local level. Therefore. I, as a city councilman, uh, I might decide, I mean, I might be a conservative on a national level and saying, I want the government to do, the federal government to do almost nothing. Federal government, stay out of our way. Federal government, lower your taxes and lower, you know, you don't, you should not be involved in welfare. You should be letting us do welfare programs on a local level where we actually know people, where we can maybe have a, a, a work aid program. We can put people to work and cleaning our parks and stuff. You get out of the welfare business, federal government, let us have it on the local government level. So suddenly I become, a, in, a, in a sense, a liberal locally because I'm a conservative nationally. Because I believe that local government should be doing that stuff, doing the things that the liberals want the federal government to do. And so it's not so much a decision of do we have some welfare programs the question is, who runs welfare programs? Will it be the federal government? You know, 4,000 miles away in Washington, D.C., or will it be our local government overseen by local people helping local people? Who should be running welfare? And so it, it, when you get to a local level, it can be very confusing who is a conservative, who's a liberal, because it manifests itself in different ways. It's pretty well delineated on a national level. Um, and again, it's not always liberal does not necessarily mean liberal in America uh, because some of the things that are going on, uh, especially with, you know, their, their repression. Like right now with these hearings, you may, you know, some of you anyway are certainly aware of uh, impeachment hearings on President Trump. Well, they're not allowing uh, his 
um, supporters in Congress to choose all of the people they want to interview in those in those hearings. Uh, they're not letting them interview the person who made the original charge anonymously. That is anti-due process. That is totally against the Sixth Amendment uh, of the Constitution. But the Democrats are insisting on in violating due process in this process of impeaching a, a president of the United States. Uh, that is very not liberal. Um, that is unconstitutional. Uh, ultimately, if that if they had the power to actually finish the job, so to speak, but they have to. All they do is recommend his impeachment. Then it'll go to the U.S. Senate, and the U.S. Senate, first off, is controlled by Republicans who are supporters of Trump. So it's not going to. They're going to find something much more than they have now to get him removed from office. But if they did, um, they would um, still have to follow due process. Uh, or the Supreme Court would intervene and say, okay, we're throwing this thing out. You violated due process. So at this point, the Supreme Court's staying out of the argument in the House of Representatives who, who decides whether or not there should be a trial. That's all they're deciding. When they, we call, talk about impeachment in America, it's a decision of whether there should be a trial that the president should be thrown out, but the Senate becomes the jury, so to speak. The Senate uh, then takes over the case. Uh, but right now in the House, they are totally violating due process. Absolutely. They're not letting um, the, the uh, pro-Trump side ask all the, you know, ask all the questions they want to ask. They're not letting them uh, bring in all the people they want to interview uh, and so forth. And they're the, the head of the committee is acting like the prosecutor, the judge, uh, and frequently the witness. He's, he's, Sometimes it takes a half an hour to give his opinion as what's going on right in the middle of this of this hearing. Uh, this um, so it's you know kind of a bizarre situation. Um, okay, uh, so gatekeeping again runs up and down um, and throughout the organization. And so the main decision is who do you hire? Do you have an organization? That's why the other day I think I suggested I wonder. American media have become so partisan. Most of them are on the Democrat side. 18 of the top 20 lean towards the Democrats. Only two of the top 20 lean towards the Republicans. Um, and uh, that would be Fox and then a newspaper, Washington Times. So it's very unbiased, I mean, it's very off balanced, unbalanced reporting in America because two can't outweigh 18. It's hard to it's hard to keep up. Um, it was getting to in that anyway. Uh, but again, it depends on the issues, and that's talking politics. Um, there are other areas. Uh, for example, it's, it's kind of strange right now. You might have heard that uh, President Trump was trying to pull tr troops out of Syria. He doesn't want. He wants to get. He wants to stop having wars related to overthrowing uh, governments, uh, even if they're governments they does, he doesn't like. He wants to get out of those kind of wars. Um, that actually was the norm in the origin of, of America. The first president, George Washington, who was our first general and our first president, uh, said that we should not become entangled in other people's messes. Uh, so that's, uh, and that was pretty much the, the sentiment of everybody in the early years of, of America. But then gradually, gradually, they decided they were the policemen of the world and got into wars they could not win, uh, at least they're not willing to win, not willing to, you know, for example, use an atomic bomb to win a war in Vietnam, for example. They weren't going to do that. And so they didn't win wars like that. Um, and, and in the past, the Democrats have always been the, the party of supposedly anti-war uh, party. And here comes this Republican saying, we need to pull out of all, we need to bring our troops home. But we're into too many messes over here. Let's get them out of here and bring them home. And I, ironically, it's the Democrats are among the most vociferous in opposing President Trump in ending the wars, ending our, our involvement. So it's hard to figure. It's hard to follow all this. Uh, okay. New media. What's the difference between the gatekeeping in traditional 
news media and new media? Are we seeing any difference in gatekeeping? What do you think? Right now, we're in a situation where, um, well, I mentioned earlier, the Washington Post had 900 people in their news staff. How many people are typically in a new media news staff? Not very many. Uh, that was one of the big differences between newspapers and TV. TV typically has relatively few people in their news staff. Even the networks, you know, they might have, I don't know, a network might have 100 people. I don't know. I, I don't know if they have 100, but let's say they have 100. That doesn't compare to 900, right? So there's only only four national TV networks in America, and I'm sure none of them have more than 100 people in their newsroom. And so they're nowhere close to the Washington Post or the New York Times or the LA Times in how many people they have reporting the news. Um, and nonetheless, they are traditional and you have the same sort of thing, kind of more like what I experienced with the 50 person staff of the daily paper I was at. Uh, so it's a little more manageable. You have fewer people to have to oversee. Uh, you can still, still everybody to some degree has some gatekeeping uh, capability. Uh, still a lot of it depends on hiring. Uh, as far as controlling whether or not you're going to uh, uh, bias the news, make it partisan or not, that sort of stuff. Um, I, something I, I started to lead to it and I've got my, my train derailed a little bit. I brought up the other day, if I could, if I really, I would be interested if I had the money to try to start a national medium where I actually, by hiring practices, hire just as many conservatives as liberals. Make, you know, try to make an unbiased news medium by the hiring process, which does not now occur. I wonder what the results of that would be. I wonder if Americans would respond positively to that, or if the, if the population itself has become so partisan that they wouldn't want a new, an, unpart, an, an unbiased news medium. I'm not even sure. It might go broke because it doesn't, it might not have a following that wanted unbiased news. And so that's, that's also part of the problem in, in, uh, in gatekeeping is that the news medium is going to be influenced by their consumers. Uh, Fox, for example, they have a, a pretty hard nosed, um, interviewer named Chris Wallace and there's a bunch of people want them to fire Chris Wallace. Um, I think some of his questioning is somewhat biased questioning myself, but the last thing I'd want them to do is, is fire Chris Wallace because he is probably the most notable journalist they have in the entire TV network. And the fact that he's willing to ask tough questions even of you know, Fox is a conservative medium. The fact that, they have, that he's willing to ask those tough questions of conservatives and he's making people mad, he's making their viewers mad because they're conservative and he's acting as a non-conservative in his journalism. Um, he could well be fired because of that, because it's the audience that is demanding he be fired. And I don't think they should by any, I don't, absolutely don't think they should, but my, I'm only one member of the audience and they have millions of people in their audience. And so I'm hearing, seeing these stories and stuff about, ah, fire Chris Wallace, fire Chris Wallace. Um, I think that would, absolutely they should not do that. Um, so that leads me back. I wonder if a news meeting that really did try to equalize uh, it's, it's coverage and make its coverage unbiased by hiring the same number of conservatives and liberals um, and, you know, insisting on unbiased reporting, whether it even survive in America right now. I think there's a good chance it wouldn't. A good chance it would not survive. So you, you end up, in a way, you end up with the audience becoming a gatekeeper. 
that may not be the traditional the traditional interpretation of that term but if you think about it they are if they insist on somebody being fired which a number of people have been fired by the different media because of the uh, because of the audience uh, conservatives have been fired from the liberal media and vice versa if they're controlling if the the consumers themselves are controlling the hiring practices of who they like who they don't like they are becoming gatekeepers uh, now uh, going to the web though back to there we have much smaller organizations uh, the other traditional media are losing also. They've lost half their journalists in America. Half the journalists have been fired. So overall, the number of journalists in America is half of what it was uh, well, 12 years ago, something like that, half. So just the number of employees you have affects everything. Can we do investigative reporting? Uh, do we have the enough people that we can free up somebody to go investigate this or investigate that. The main thing about investigative, investigative reporting is time. Can we, uh, well, basically time as it relates to personnel. Can we free up people to become investigative reporters? Investigative reporters basically by definition are those who have time to go to do research in more depth where they can, they don't have a daily deadline where they can go investigate something for a week, two weeks, maybe even longer, uh, and come out with an occasional story, but they're, they are, their deadlines are much further and farther apart than the, than the daily, than the, those working on, on a daily deadline. So there are fewer and fewer media, even among traditional, who can afford to support true investigative reporting. Uh, some of them are pretending, and that may be one of the problems, for example, the New York Times and the Washington Post have really been wrong in a lot of reporting. Uh, part of it is their bias against President Trump. Um, the, but they've had lots of stories that proved have turned out to be absolutely false. And that bias is part of it. But also part of it is that they have reporters who have, who want to be investigative reporters, but they have daily deadlines. And so what are they doing? So now you, what you find is they're depending on anonymous sources. Um, I think I talked about that once before about the treatment of anonymous sources. You know, they, when you go back to one of the most famous um, team of, of investigative reporters, it, reporters, it'd be Woodward and Bernstein, who are credited largely with uh, President Trump or President Nixon re uh, uh, resigning back in 1973, 74, whatever that was. Um, they're given a lot of credit for that in movies with, you know, famous actors have, have depicted uh, their work. Um, part of, you know, the question there, again, the Washington Post had, were able to set them loose and, and uh, work on that, that report, you know, that reporting exclusively. Um, anyway, they had an anonymous source named Deep Throat. They nicknamed him Deep Throat. And even to this day, we don't know who Deep Throat was. However, with their anonymous source, they never, they were very reluctant to ever write a story. In fact, I'm not sure they ever did write a story based only on Deep Throat's testimony. Uh, Deep Throat was somebody who gave them background and said, now go find evidence. He told them basically, you cannot use me as your source. I am your background. I'll tell you where to go. I'll point you where to go. You go do it. And so, because otherwise it, they could have tracked back and, you know, found out who, you know, the, the Nixon administration could have tried to silence him if they had figured out who Deep Throat was. And so they had to protect Deep Throat uh, and have to this very day, nobody knows for sure who Deep Throat was, um, but they used him as background and then they went and found sources they could name. That's good reporting, okay? 
Um, but right now, in this era, there you have a problem where you have a, a conservative president. You have a bureaucracy. 90% voted for Hillary. Well, all the people working under the president, which are hundreds of thousands, um, voted for his opponent. Uh, you have um, uh, misspelling bureaucracy. Okay. okay, you have um, a, a media. Uh, somewhere about five or one um, from Hillary. Did not want him to win. Uh, you have uh, the Democrats, they're obviously their Democratic opponents or Democrats by, by you know, obvious. Uh, you have Hollywood. Ninety percent of their uh, financial support and other support is going to people like Hillary, liberals, would you say? And you have professors, not like me. And those are somewhere. Uh, all professors. So those are agricultural professors brother, or business professor, or science professor, when you get to the subject of that everybody in front of the state has education courses in science, and government, sociology, psychology, uh, those would be like no less than 10 to 1, no less than 10 to 1 liberal. When you look at that, it's almost a miracle that President Trump wants to buy so long. Uh, it, it's, it's a really stacked deck in America right now. Uh, and yet, it's about 50 50. Overall, the liberal to conservative in America is 50 50, but in some of the most important industries, it is really lopsided. And so, you may get enough information out of the news that you may be absolutely sure that Trump is guilty. But check your sources. Who's saying that? You know, what I was getting to originally, though, is that these people, the bureaucracy, anonymous. And so there have been a stream of anonymous stories being printed for these first three years of President Trump's uh, uh, regime that have been unnamed. They're, no, they're anonymous, and most of them Um, of course, they don't want to admit that, so you're never going to hear them apologize for their bad coverage. You'll never hear that. But they told us from the very start of the of the uh, um, investigation into the dossier uh, that they got supposedly from the Russians that they had plenty of material to impeach them. You know, the, the Democrat leader said it, Hollywood said it, media said it, the bureaucrats said it, and even even though.
and they said, no, we can't find enough evidence to impeach him on on uh, Russian conspiracy. It wasn't there. And so these people came in, these people came in, these people came in, and he said, oh, Biden, in fact, there's enough. No matter how long we are, we can't come up with enough to make a case against him. Uh, and these people, and these people, these people, these people, I've never apologized. We uh, won't expect him to. So, it's a very strange situation. And the, going back to the new media gatekeeping, um, they have small, smaller staffs. Uh, they will never be able to, I can't imagine them ever being able to keep up with traditional media as the traditional media go out of, go out of business, which I am predicting. I don't know how they don't. Uh, we just, I mentioned just recently, the uh, Salt Lake Tribune went nonprofit, which means it anticipates it's going to always lose money. It hopes it has people to support it and keep it going, but it's looking for handouts. It's begging for money um, because the circulation and the advertising won't support it. And so it's becoming nonprofit. Uh, other, I think I mentioned two other newspapers, the uh, Tampa Bay Times um, is begging for money. So their advertising and their, their subscriptions are not paying, they're going broke. I mentioned my former employer, the McClatchy, I already talked about. They're the last uh, corporate report I saw from them, I've mentioned before, they, they lost only $20 million that year. Um, they're going broke. Uh, so will new, will the, you know, what's happening in the new environment? I think what, what we're seeing mostly in the, the new media environment is they don't have very good gatekeeping. Um, because they don't have many levels. I mentioned all those different levels in traditional media that, that things were being gatekeeped, if you would. Uh, in new media, you just don't have the staffing to do that. So you're gonna have even less control of reporters. Uh, some of them are just bloggers now, so they are one, just one person organizations, but even if they are associated with something like uh, a TV network, uh, they don't have as much control over their their online staff, and those people are going to um, there's going to be less and less control, less and less gatekeeping there. So you're going to see a lot more independent uh, writing. And what can we anticipate? Here come the white knights. Here I come to you know to save the day. Uh, we can anticipate more than that, more of that, and not less, because there's nobody to tell them. You know, you've got to make your story unbiased. You have to be fair in your coverage. They're, those people won't exist. They don't exist now, basically, because of the partisanship. But even despite that, with fewer people, there's just less control in management. And in, of all the places where we're seeing the least control, it's on the, the, uh, the new media environment. Also, we have a whole different thing because what's the deadline for new media? At the newspaper I had, our deadline was about midnight. All day long, reporters were reporting and they were coming, they were sending their stuff to their Metro editor. The Metro editor was checking it for content. Uh, once he would satisfy the content, the Metro editor would give it to the copy desk. We would check it over for spelling and grammar and maybe do the rewrite the lead and a few things. We would do the production of it, um, the headlining and stuff. And at, by midnight, we had to be done. And uh, I was the last person out the door to make sure there were no problems remaining with the newspaper. So we had the entire day to prepare the newspaper. And now with new, new media, what's your deadline? As soon as you can. As soon as you can get it on their website, you want that news on the website. So we have fewer people and we want news sent out immediately. You get that story done. Send it out immediately now. You don't have you don't have time for all this layer of of editors to check it over before it hits the web, uh, because that's not to the nature of the web. The main the nature of the web is immediate deadlines. As soon as you're done, get it in there. Get it done fast. Go 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 go. We want to beat the opposition. Go go go. Um, and so, by the very nature of gatekeeping in the new media environment, there isn't much. 
there's less and less gatekeeping all the time. Um, fewer people in, in line to gatekeep, faster deadlines, so you don't have time to gatekeep. And so it's a very different environment. If we wanted to investigate, uh, wanted to investigate uh, gatekeeping, what theories would we might we want to use? What techniques might we want to use? What theories and what what techniques, investigative te or yeah, research techniques might we use with gatekeeping? You can start with either one, theory or or technique. Independent. That's the obvious one for the theory. Um, so you, you start analyzing who's uh, setting the agenda. Now, how are we going to prove something related to that? Analysis is probably the one that's most frequently used in this sort of uh, investigation. Uh, there are others. Uh, well, let me go back. Content analysis is probably, no matter what they're looking for, that's probably still the most popular. But, but what would you look at in content analysis? There are different things that you could look at to try to show why. Okay, so when it's headlines or content, what words are they using? Are the words they use, do they carry, you know, connotations or definition? What are they? Are they biased by their very nature? The words themselves. Um, for example, one of the researchers uh, found that um, whenever they're they talking about Republicans, they would say the ultra uh, conservative. If they're uh, talking about the, the Democrats. They just say Democrat. So they put some adjectives. When they're describing a Republican, they put in some adjectives that make it sound like, you know, they're off the edge here. They're ultra ultra conservative. The Democrat is just a Democrat. But, you know, so they, they did find some adjectives to help uh, bias their reporting, and it was not just the headlines, it was throughout the story. They found that, that uh, so you can do content analysis and look for what words are being associated with people from Democrats, this party or that party. And they found a big difference um, in, in those. Uh, they uh, looked at uh, the framing. Now, in order to look at framing, however, um, part of the, the difficulty in content analysis is who's going to do the analysis. The point of the point of view wants to do content analysis. Are you unbiased? And so when you do the good kind of analysis, you have to come up with teams um, or individuals to do the analysis. 
that uh, are that you can argue are not biased. So with the with the uh, research I mentioned with the uh, sources, how many sources, how many conservative sources did they choose? How many liberal sources? They made teams, uh, two person teams. One had to have voted for the Democrat in the previous election, and one had to have voted for the Republican in the previous election. So they had several teams, but they all were matched up that way. So they could make the argument, this is the end. Their rule was, you have to agree for it to be considered conservative. You both have to agree for the source to be considered liberal. You both have to agree. If you can't agree, we'll call it neutral. Now, even that could cause some, but they, they didn't think, seem to think there was uh, any problem uh, with that teaming. Uh, there wasn't uh, the... The liberals and conservatives in the team did not seem to be trying to politicize it. They seemed to be, you know, they were having to answer to the professors and the professors wanted them to do it properly and they're being paid to do it. So there seemed to, that seemed to have worked out well. So you have to justify who's doing the analysis. Uh, now, a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, university theses are questionable on that, on that behalf, on that part. Uh, because you you know you can't go out and hire a bunch of people and you know pros and cons and balance them and so forth. So content analysis analysis is a little bit hard to do as a thesis, but that and that's the difficulty of it is who's doing the analysis and is that person unbiased? Um, but there are theses done with content analysis, uh, but they could be questioned if they if you have submitted them for journal analysis or journal publication. They would probably be questioned on that basis. Uh, is this an unbiased analysis? Um, social control in the newsroom. The uh, in the same way I mentioned before, there was a study that showed that that made it uh, you could predict how a member of Congress was going to vote by knowing who his best friends were. Uh, that is a type of social control, uh, or at least that's an indication of social control. If you can predict, if your theory is and your methodology is good enough that you can predict with over 90% accuracy how somebody's going to vote, then you're doing, you know, that's a good, you know, you're doing something right. And so, um, you can look at that. I wanted to look at it when I was doing my master's thesis. That was something that intrigued me, is uh, how to use that in the in the social setting of a newsroom. Um, if you can do it for Congress, you can do that in a newsroom. You can do it in other settings. Does that really prove, what is it you're proving, though, if you can predict with 90% accuracy, the what somebody's going to do by who their two best friends are. Does that necessarily prove that they are going to be biased in their in their journalistic work? Uh, probably not. Maybe I don't know. Maybe if you balance, you said, okay, we're going to determine who their best friends are. Now we're going to uh, compare that to what sources, whether they have biased sources, maybe you would find a correlation. Uh, their best friends are liberal or conservative, and their sources tend to be more conservative than liberal or liberal than conservative, whatever you know orientation they were. Maybe. Maybe you could find that correlation. Um, by the way, on that subject, the correlations, it's correlation causation. What's the problem with assuming that correlation is causation? Can you come up with an example where correlation is not causation? Anybody know of anything? There are actually scientists out there getting a lot of publications by simply running correlations. They're running correlations of strange things, like people who eat peanut butter and how they vote, whatever. They, they're, they're, they're looking at all sorts of correlations and they're finding some very strong correlations in places that you, that you can see, you cannot possibly imagine any causation. And they're being published uh, because they have a high correlation. 
and and what you you know to get published high correlations help get published even though their their causation their theory of causation is has to be bizarre i mean i this example is made up out of my mind but the correlations they found are like that you know people who eat peanut butter and people who vote a certain way or something they have bizarre causation or bizarre correlations that you cannot imagine a causation being involved um and people, like I say, are being published based on it. And that's what they're doing. They're just going out looking for correlations. See, we'll correlate with that, this with that, and this with that, and this with that, and this with that, and, until they find a correlation that is strong. And they say, ah, we'll publish. We'll go for that. Uh, it's bizarre um, because correlation is not necessarily causation. There are certainly times when you think it, it should be. Um, the amount of cancer caused by smoking, for example, it took many, many years before uh, the American government was willing to take action against the tobacco industry, partly because they put a lot of money into lobbying. And so, so part of it was just money, just uh, political backing. But part of it was also this question is, you know, can you prove causation by correlation? After they stacked up enough enough studies and after the tobacco industry stopped lying about some of the studies, uh, they caught them lying and some that, that had stalled. It finally became obvious, yes, there is causation between smoking and cancer. Um, but there are a lot of areas where it doesn't necessarily hold that, that correlation is causation. Um, for example, one of them that I thought about quite a bit, there was a there was a study, I may have mentioned this, sorry if I'm reiterating myself, but there was a, there was a story on the front page of our, our local newspaper, the one I used to work for, uh, that had a high correlation between taking vitamins and dying younger. People who took vitamins died younger. So what do you conclude from that? Well, what it seems to say is that you shouldn't take vitamins then. What other, what other correlations, however, you know, what could cause that to be false? What, what else could be true that would cause that finding to be false, that, or at least that, that conclusion that vitamins cause you to die younger? You know, synthetic vitamins. Now, it could be that synthetic vitamins do cause you to die younger. I'm not ruling that out. There is apparently a, a good, pretty good correlation for that. But what else could be true? Why could that not be true? Why could that not be the causation? You may want to ponder, a, I want to suggest a counter conclusion or a counter theory that you could base further research on. So the correlation is the more vitamins you take, the younger you're going to die. Causation or not causation? I don't know if they settled that issue, by the way. I, I haven't really followed it. Um, but I would suggest one alternative that you'd want to check is, do people who feel sick take more vitamins? You would think they would, right? People who are sick take vitamins. Therefore, people who are sick take vitamins and they die younger. So they correlate, but did the vitamins cause them to die younger? Rather, they took vitamins because they were sick, and then they died because they were sick. So you can find correlations that do not prove causation. Uh, this is a problem with, uh, I've, I've mentioned this before also, in studying pornography or violence in society. Now, I happen to think violence in TV and movies and, um, and games does have some influence in violence in society. And I do believe that pornography has some, has some correlation, you know, not just correlation, but has some causation when it comes to things like rape. But the experts say they, that they can't prove causation. Uh, we have the same problem. Almost every rapist, in fact, I've heard every rapist, 100%. Every rapist who's ever been convicted 
has been a, an, an avid pornography user. That's a correlation, a very high correlation. Those who commit rape use pornography. Well, what's the other excuse for that? <laughs> because they're, they're hooked on sex or they're hooked on the thrill they get out of, out of pornography. That doesn't, and, and you can't turn it around and say the same thing if you turn it around. When somebody uses pornography, they do not automatically become a rapist. Not every, even avid pornography users, you don't have necessarily a, a real, real strong, at least they say, at least not strong enough correlation to say that a user of pornography will commit rape. Uh, it certainly, you, it certainly isn't every case. So is there some correlation? Probably some correlation, but you can't, you can't run experiments and cause people to, to commit rape by showing them pornography, uh, with a real high, um, you know, follow through real, real high, um, a real high correlation if you do it that way and experimental. So you have this one where you can study statistics and show the, the correlation, but when you go to experimental, you can't necessarily prove it experimentally. Um, same thing uh, with the, uh, those you know, students on campus, for example, that, that might be playing violent games on their computers. Do they all go out and, and commit murder? Well, I think you know they don't, or we'd have a lot of deaths on campus. Uh, so playing violent games did not necessarily cause you to go commit murder. In fact, there's a counter in both of them. There's a counter argument that somebody who uses pornography is less likely to, to rape because they're relieving themselves a different way. And there's some, and somebody who uses violent games is less likely to go commit murder because they're getting they're getting their release through the violent game instead. I don't know. Um, but you see the difficulty in trying to analyze or trying to come up with conclusive evidence to prove one way or the other. Therefore, those two things have never been proven. Those are not considered to be provable. Um, either uh, the, you know, rape, incident of rape, there are, I mean, the correlation could be very high. There was one study I remember from somewhere in this area, it might have been Malaysia, I don't know, somewhere in this area, uh, I wouldn't have been Malaysia because it went the wrong direction. They went from having heavy control of pornography to having no control and the rape went up dramatically. So that would seem to be about as good an evidence we have that rape can be caused by pornography is that all the only thing that they can say at least you know the, the, one of the main variables is they stopped controlling pornography and suddenly there was more rape um, could we come up with other reasons probably um, have what happened to the culture did the whole culture uh, change uh, for a variety of reasons why, why is it they stopped enforcing pornography laws, anti-pornography laws. Something would happen in society to make that happen. What, what, what were those factors? Um, I don't know. Uh, again, I have my own thoughts on it. I'd like to control those things a little more. I, I guess I'd be a little bit less liberal in those areas if I were king of America. Uh, but there is difficulty proving that stuff. Uh, correlation and causation are not the same thing. Um, and so getting to that point where you can say this is proven is difficult with, with a lot of these areas in communication. Um, anyway, going back to the newsroom, socio-psychological factors, um, we could be talking about groupthink. We talked about that in the, in the past, the theories of groupthink, that if you're surrounded by people that agree with you, uh, excessively so, then suddenly you can't even comprehend that anybody who thinks contrary to you is not an idiot. Because what they're saying to you is nonsense, uh, as defined uh, by Kuhn. Um, 
the earlier the I mentioned him in the 1950s, you know, writing the uh, about the scientific revolutions. If uh, you know, are the way we see the world and in, in, in uh, uh, whether it's science or anything else is uh, is such that uh, you know we're, are, we we have a certain paradigm, you could say. And so when people thought the earth was flat, they had a certain paradigm that they lived by. They did not go very far away in their ships because they were afraid they were going to go off the edge of the world. And so they were careful about how far they would, would take their ships. They were working under a paradigm that the earth was flat um, and so forth. So, you know, science has creates its own paradigms that control how we act. Uh, there are paradigms like that, that that can control in a newsroom. So if you are in a newsroom that is heavily, heavily conservative or liberal, and so your workmates are all the time feeding you information to support that perspective, then everything that the other side, uh, say it's conservative, we'll say that conservatives are evil in this case. Uh, so you have a very, you have Fox News, and everybody at Fox News is conservative. Now that's not true, but we'll say that it is. So everybody at Fox News is conservative. Everybody thinks that the that the the President Trump is perfect. Everybody thinks that the evidence being provided is nonsense. Can't what will they do when suddenly there's evidence that suggests President Trump's guilty? Well, how will they handle that? They will probably not handle it well because the power of the group think socio socially and psychologically is so powerful that they will have a hard time dealing with that counter evidence, a very hard time, um, and vice versa. If they're a liberal newsroom and everybody around them is liberal, then they are convinced that President Trump is evil and they are bound and determined to get rid of him. Um, do they have other motivations besides just group think that they're surrounded by? Maybe, maybe they do. I don't know. Um, some of the things uh, Fox, I don't know if you've, any of you have watched Fox coverage on this stuff, but sometimes they will put on a, a just real fast a whole bunch of the other media, the, the liberal media, and just clip out like two seconds, two seconds, two seconds, two seconds, two seconds of the, particularly of the broadcast versions. And those people are using exactly the same words. It looks like it's a conspiracy because <laughs> when when President Trump met with uh, Putin, Putin uh, Trump has a very odd way of negotiating. It's not that not as odd in business as you might think it is, but in politics it's very odd. And so one of the things that President Trump does when he's in a negotiating mode, whether it's North Korea or Russia or whoever, is in public he tries to be very friendly towards his his opponent. And so, I mean, right here, when when uh, when he met with uh, the North Korean dictator in uh, in Singapore, he was acting like they were best buddies, um, and it, it it was appalling to American media. How can you act like your friends? You know, this is somebody's killing people and and talking about shooting missiles at America, and he's a, a brutal dictator of North Korea. How can you be friendly to him? That's his style. That's that's is Trump's style, and he was that way also with Putin. And so one of those clips, series of clips, was that every news media, every liberal news medium called it treason. They all called his his public pronouncements as he's standing next to Putin treasonous, 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 treason, 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 treason. Every one of them did. Once and and it goes right now. The big thing, uh, the Democrats in their current efforts to get rid of Trump, they did a um, a, a uh, they call it um, I always forget the term. Term anyway. Uh, so anyway, they brought a whole bunch of people together. And they interviewed them, and they talked, uh, and they decided what 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 word would the average American react most negatively to? 
at first when this thing with the Ukraine, they were saying that President Trump had threatened, basically they were saying that he wasn't going to give Ukraine a billion dollars or whatever it was in, in military aid if, if uh, the president of the Ukraine didn't agree to look up, to find dirt on the, on the Bidens. And so the first word they, they started using was quid pro quo, which mean, basically means I'll give you this or you give me that. And so they were running with this idea of quid pro quo. Uh, and most Americans didn't react very violently to quid pro quo. It's not, not something that, that stirred up their emotions. And so they uh, uh, tried to... Uh, They're saying that Trump was bribing, was using American money to bribe the Ukrainian president. And so now every one of the liberal TV stations is every day they're saying bribery, 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 bribery. Even though there's actually no evidence that bribery took place, but that's the word they've decided to use. And that was actually... Um, it was the Democrats had a had a brainstorming session to decide which was the best word to use when it came to uh, attacking the president, and they decided that, that the average American hated the word bribery the most, so they decided to use bribery as their as the word they would attack him on instead of quid pro quo. And so now all the media are saying, "Wait a minute, that's not what we're talking Anyway, so it, it almost seems like sometimes a an actual conspiracy of the liberal of the liberal media, which I myself find hard to believe, very hard to believe that they would actually conspire in their reporting. Biased, yeah, but conspire. This seems so unlikely from my experience in the media that. Even though it seems like it, you talk about correlations. Yeah, it's almost a hundred correlation, hundred percent correlation. With one of them uses one term, they're all using that term like they were told to, which is crazy. Uh, one of the funniest examples was uh, one of the one of the media came up with a story that because of president's uh, anti Mexican Mexican sentiments. Uh, that the cost of avocados was going to skyrocket in America. And every one of the mainstream media ran a story on its front page about the skyrocketing price of avocados. And the Republicans just laughed. They thought that was so bizarre. Who is going to change their vote because the price of avocados is going to be higher? It was just bizarre, and yet they all ran that story. They all featured that story that day. It must have been a very slow news day because it, it makes absolutely no sense uh, to, to think that everybody is going to uh, the price of avocados. Um, anyway, the term I always, I don't know why I can't, anyway, focus groups is the type of, is the method they use to decide which words to use. And the liberal media have, in, have adopted it. So the focus group and the, the media have accepted their results. We're going to say that, that Trump is committing bribery or committed bribery. Um, how could you take this from a different perspective? Uh, let's take a look at, think about the different methods of research. In our field, what could you do? I, I already told you it's kind of it, it's it's going to be hard to do experimentation with uh, pornography, for example. Uh, what if you were successful and you caused somebody to rape somebody? You know, so you have ethical questions about doing experimental research in our area. Uh, if you actually were successful, you would be guilty of aiding and abetting a crime. Um, so, but let's take something less violent than rape or murder or something. But can we, can you envision experimental, how could we use experimentation as a method in communications? 
is there experimentation we could use? Because anybody can imagine, let's brainstorm a little bit. Can you imagine a topic that you could study where you could reasonably implement experimentation? Very rare among uh, theses. Um, but could you pull it off? Can you think of something you could do experimentally for a thesis or whatever other purpose uh, in the area of communication? Let you think about that a second. There was an example, actually, um, given in the textbook in the uh, Understanding uh, Media and Culture textbook. You might think back to that. They did give it at least one, maybe multiple examples. We actually had an example here the other day that we talked about in class. So what kind of experimentation might you implement in the field of communications? Can we come up with anything? The one here is says this in the in experimental research participants may show one group of children a program with three incidents of cartoon violence and another control group of similar children the same program without the violent incident. Researchers can ask the children from both groups to finish their questions and results are compared. So it's they're just they're it's experimental. They're basing on asking questions later. Um, maybe the questions might be something like uh, maybe it'd be kind of similar to what they saw in the cartoon. Maybe uh, in the cartoon one character punches somebody else for doing something. So then you ask the kid, you know, what would you do if this happened to you? You explain the situation and uh, see if they're more likely, which group is more likely to say, I'd punch him, you know, whatever. Um, that might uh, be one way. Of doing it. And then when, uh, weeks ago, related to, uh, um, the inoculation theory of propaganda. You remember that one? Uh, I, I was thinking, in fact, I have written something. I just wrote something, uh, something short for a blog. Uh, well, I, I haven't actually published the blog yet. But one of, one of my pet things that I mentioned that you all know is kind of a pet peeve of mine or a pet concern of mine is the uh, theory of... Uh, uh, the, well, the inoculation theory of propaganda. Indeed, you have, you know, you're coming up with a, you have a, an assignment to look at that. And so do you remember, we shot, saw a video related to uh, the theory of propaganda. And it led me to an interesting conclusion that I am going to blog about, uh, about what is the result going to be in, over the next, well, before the next election in America, a result of this uh, effort by the Democrats to impeach President Trump. Uh, anybody want to anticipate what my what my I'm going to conclude and why I'm going to conclude it, and it relates to the inoculation theory of propaganda. What do you think I think is going to happen in the next election? Possibly. I mean, I'm still predicting, but I'm basing it on a theory. 
and on research. So I'm going to blog on this re on this research. What do you think I think is going to happen as a result of the Democrats trying to impeach President Trump? And roll out lots of negative information about him. They're, they're flooding the America TV channels with uh, these, these uh, biased proceedings headed up by the Democrats. So what would be the natural, if we're going to use the... Um, some, some have called it the hyperdermic, hyperdermic needle. So that's kind of like the inoculation theory. But it's also but basically a direct effects theory or the hyperdermic, hyperdermic needle. And it's the same thing, basically. What would be the conclusion? What would be the prediction based on that of American TV going, you know, like eight hours a day on a proceeding of hearings, anti-Trump hearings, led up, you know, led by his, uh, by his opponents. What would be the the uh, direct effects theory results of that happening? What do you think? You know, what would, in other words, what would the direct effects theory tell us will happen? Because the the TV channels have been filled up with anti-Trump. Um, Propaganda, we can call it. Direct effects is going to, uh, is going to say what? That they're going to be influ influenced it right, by it, right? That the public, American public, is going to be influenced, and they they might vote Trump out of office because the Democrats have staged two months already of anti-Trump, one-sided testimony where they haven't allowed the Republicans to uh, bring in all their counter um, uh, witnesses. And so the direct effects or hyperdermic needle uh, conclusion would be eh, Trump is in trouble. Uh, at first sight, what would be the, um, again, the, the media, the 18 liberal media are all saying uh, just yesterday, they said the the uh, uh, witness yesterday was a bombshell. They have Trump now. They're all saying that. Uh, so now the the Fox and Washington Times are laughing at them for that. They're saying no, it was no bombshell. Um, and in fact, they they're running clips where the the key witness that they're saying was the, laid the bombshell admitted he had no direct evidence. In fact, his only direct evidence was he asked President Trump directly what he, what he wants to do about, about the Ukraine. Uh, he wants to withhold the, you know, what are you going to do with the, with the money that, that Congress has, uh, has approved for them for their, for their uh, national defense? Uh, is it a quid pro quo? And he had to admit under oath yesterday that, no, that President Trump said, no, there's no quid pro quo. I just want the Ukraine president do what he promised in his when he was elected, um, and so that's the only direct conversation he had with Trump. With Trump denying that there was any quid pro quo, that he they were going to get their money, but he wanted to make he he did want the president of the the new Ukrainian president to do what he promised when he was when he was elected, which was to uh, yes to investigate corruption. Basically, that was what he had promised. He was the anti-corruption. He's kind of the Trump of the Ukraine. And so he had promised to weed out corruption in the government. So he said, just do what you promise. Um, and so he did say some other things that sounded like bombshells, but then when the Republicans finally pinned him down, that was his answer. That was the only thing, that he, the, the only direct knowledge he had was a conversation with Trump who said, no, there's no quid pro quo. It's fine. I just want the president to do what he promised when he was elected. Uh, so... It's, it's, it's interesting to see the total 180 degree difference in how they reported that. The 18 liberal media all said it was a bombshell. The two conservative media out of the top 20 said it was a dud. There was nothing there. Was nothing there. Um, so if we look at the, uh, the inoculation theory of propaganda, what would be our first conclusion out of that, what's going to happen to Trump based on 
inoculation theory. Is there going to be any significant difference between inoculation and direct effect? If you look at the inoculation theory on the surface anyway, they're still being, you know, still 18 of the top 20 media are saying it's a bombshell. He's guilty, guilty, guilty. Only two are standing up for him. That would seem to suggest a perfect um, setup for inoculation theory. The 18 liberal media are saying, you know, giving all the evidence they can come up with that he's guilty and very little uh, coverage of the Republicans saying, you know, that's just not true. You're, you're mis misreporting this, you know, what happened. Um, they're, you know, they have all these talking commentators. They have a whole row of prestigious people, like six people around a table. And those people are saying, oh yeah, he's dead. You know, he's, he's, we've got him now, sort of comments. Uh, this was a bombshell, 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 bombshell. That was what every medium said yesterday. Bombshell, 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 bombshell. All the liberal media. So that would seem to suggest, you know, the uneven uh, coverage means he's he's going to lose and, you know, lose next November. It would seem to. But we watched a video that suggested something else. And I'm predicting there's something else. Uh, anybody remember that video? What I'm talking about? They did, and I, I don't have all the recollection myself, so I'm, um, I may be off a little bit. I don't want to replay the video. Um, about uh, that it was bad to brush your teeth. Remember that video? They did experimental research and told, and uh, the essence of it was to prove to people that it was bad to brush your teeth. Uh, but they had different people they were doing this experiment on. And they had different treatment. So they had, I don't remember exact, I don't remember the numbers, but I remember the general uh, results were, were interesting. So the message was the same for all of them. Uh, one of them, I remember, was uh, all they said to him was um, they basically saying they're going to lie to you in this. And you're going to go in this room and watch a bit, and they're going to lie to you. That was the that was their their inoculation. They're going to lie to you. Um, Another one was, I think, to give them more in-depth uh, information. One was nothing. You know, they gave them no advance warning or anything, uh, no clue as to what was going to happen. It seemed like there was four, but we'll just go with those three. So one of them is, gave them some considerable information about the importance of brushing your teeth, as I recall. One, they told them nothing. They just let them go in and be, <clears throat> and let these uh, anti, uh, <clears throat> uh, these anti-brushing people give their spiel. And one, all they said was, they're going to lie to you. So watch out. That's all they said. And then afterwards, they, they after they uh, had run this experiment, the thinking part was trying to convince them that that was, that what they were told was, was, not you know what they were told was not true, that it was uh, just an experiment. And so what they wanted to know was uh, well they, they tested them as I recall. Um, first off, they tested them if they believed what they were told in the uh, in that room. And so you know these you know as would be suggested, I think these people were not. You know, they were kind of wishy-washy. They hadn't been prepared at all before they were given this uh, treatment. These people had been prepared, so they didn't react very much to that. So, you know, let's say, you know, they they were, uh, you know, that most of that, maybe only 20% of them believed it. 
these people about the same, uh, you know, they may be about 30% of the people, or maybe it's even more, maybe like 50%, maybe these were 50% too. About 50% uh, did not believe what they were told about not brushing your teeth, that they had some inoculation. And but upon these people that had no inoculation, maybe 80% of them believed that it was true that it was bad to brush your teeth. And then, uh, and then they came out and they tried to explain to them this was, uh, this was just pretend. And it wasn't true. And so they wanted to see how much this, this backtracked on it. So now how many people uh, still believed that it was uh, um, bad to brush your teeth? And these people here, um, I, as I recall, I mean, this, the numbers aren't correct, but it's more or less. Um, And so after being told that it was that it was just an experiment, what was interesting is that the people who resisted the most being deconverted were the people who were told it was a lie. Before they went in, they were told this is going to be a lie. You're going to hear a lie. And their theory as of why they were the most resistant to unbelieving uh, that they should not, you know, that they should not brush their teeth was because while they were getting this treatment of this uh, treatment of that it's bad to brush your teeth, they felt be, they felt lied to by the person who, who told them it was going to be a lie. So they reacted against the propagandist. They, they, they reacted against the propagandist. So even when they told them afterwards, this was just an experiment. This isn't true. They still believed they shouldn't be brushing their teeth. They resisted being un, you know, deconverted, so to speak. They resisted coming back even more than the people that were told absolutely nothing about it. So those who feel like they're betrayed, who have them been lied to, they will react more strongly than somebody who um, had no treatment at all, that was, you know, they were just ignorant. So what happens? My theory is two things are going to happen that's going to cause very possibly a conservative revolution in America. And that is, first off, when they, if they go to the Senate, if the, if the House votes for impeachment and they go to a trial in the Senate, all of the witnesses that the House uh, Democrats have not allowed them to bring forward are going to suddenly be, be testifying in public on TV and telling their side of the story. And that story is really strong. I know what that story is because I've, I've seen the, de the evidence. The evidence that the Democrats have not allowed them to bring to the public yet is really, really strong. And so what's going to happen when these people who who have been told that Trump is evil, 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 and suddenly they get a strong dose of, of evidence that he's, that he's being framed, what is their reaction going to be? It could be the worst reaction of all, the most anti-democratic reaction of all, because they have been betrayed. This feeling of betrayal could mean a landslide victory for Trump uh, a year from now, a total landslide, a wipeout. And not just a victory for Trump. It could be. It could be almost the demolition of the Democratic Party, if enough people think they've been lied to by the Democrats, they could. They could go. They they might not not have another Democrat president for, a couple of decades. It could be that strong of a reaction. I don't know that'd be that strong. But I think um, there's two sources now that you may not be well, actually three sources. So there's actually going to be three sources of, of pro-Trump evidence coming out in the next few months. That's going to be very strong. Um, 
unless I'm an idiot. I could be. But I happen to believe the sources that I've been reading and listening to, I think they're accurate. First off, in the Senate, they're going to get to bring their bring forward uh, witnesses that they're not being allowed to provide in the House. So right now, the public may feel like they may be leaning towards uh, that Trump is guilty. Um, and so right now, they're leaning that direction. But it's actually to the Democrats' um, detriment that they have been not allowing these other witnesses. Because now they had no chance to, uh, to try to manipulate things against these witnesses. And so suddenly, for example, they want to bring in Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, who is being paid more than a million dollars uh, a year by a corrupt uh, Russian oligarch in the Ukraine. Um, so they're going to bring Hunter in. They will almost undoubtedly bring officials from the Ukraine in, or get or get sworn testimony at least to the Ukrainian or the Ukrainian uh, officials who say that the Obama uh, administration was was pressuring them uh, to not investigate the corrupt company, company that Hunter Biden was, was receiving a million dollars a year from. Um, and they were being pushed by his father, Joe Biden, and even by Obama to not investigate that company. Well, once these people are brought before the Senate, that testimony is going to be wide open in, in public. Ukrainian officials are going to say, yeah, we, we wanted to investigate and and uh, we were told, you know, we had to stop it because of this threat by Joe Biden. Um, and they've got, there's quite a bit of evidence for them, not just witnesses, but also documents, emails that the conservative journalists who are being ignored have come up with. Um, of, you know, government documents, uh, trial results, a number of things. So suddenly, all this information from the Ukraine is going to come out that they're that the Democrats are keeping away from the American people. Um, they're going to insist that the anonymous source who made the accusation um, come forward and testify. Well, according, this is not 100% sure. But it seems like it's really close to 100% sure that the person that made the written allegation was very closely associated with Biden and to other people who have been attacking President Trump. He, he's gonna, his background is going to let people know that this guy was basically a, a plant. He was not uh, a disinterested or a, a reliable witness to bring up this whole thing. So the, the, anonymous, uh, the, the anonymous source that started this whole thing is, has to come testify. And it's going to be obvious that he's not a fair witness. And uh, also, even worse than that, is there's already no evidence that he first off went to the head of the, of the committee that's hearing the office running the Senate, and they went to him first. If he says, yes, we went and talked to the congressman, Schiff is the name, we went to talk to Schiff before we filed our complaint, and they told us to do this, now, Schiff may get kicked out of Congress, and he's the one heading up this whole investigation against Trump right now. And it could be very bad for Schiff. He could be literally thrown out of office, because if he, if he actually met with the source and, and persuaded him to file this complaint and all this sort of stuff, he could be out of office. Anyway, that's the, just the Senate. In addition, there's a report to come out in the next week. You're going to hear what really is going to be a bombshell. It's not about Ukraine, exactly. It could actually be somewhat about the Ukraine. But there's a report to come out from the investigative investigator general. I think that's what, it, what it, the I stands for. was looking into the prior the prior investigation of Trump and how it got started, who who put together the Russian dossier, 
Um, did they break the law in doing this? Uh, this guy is coming out probably next week, maybe the week after, with a 500-page report. And this is Obama uh, nominee. So this is not a Republican. He's a, he's a, if he's not a Democrat, at least there's somebody that Obama didn't mind having in his role. And the high suspicion is that a lot of the people have been pushing for Trump's um, impeachment could end up in jail. Um, not because of this most recent thing with the, with the Ukraine scandal, but because of the prior Russian dossier scandal, they broke some laws in doing that. And so there's some people that could end up in jail based on the investigative general uh, report, who again is an Obama appointee. And then after that, there's a, a prosecutor in the, uh, 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 the Justice Department uh, investigator, and they, they needed a separate investigator, although I think it may be less separate than, than, we, than we anticipate, that it may be possible this 500-page report is going to include some stuff from this uh, other, re other investigation. Uh, this other investigation had, this guy could only uh, examine what was happening within the Justice Department, the FBI and so forth. Uh, this guy can look at anything, any criminal activities by anybody, CIA, Congress, anybody. And we've got three sources of information that is going to almost definitely support Trump. Um, and so it's going to be like, you know, all this fairly weak evidence, weak, 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 that the Democrats themselves are putting out. It's weak evidence. And suddenly we do get bombshells from the Republicans, really big bombshells, uh, people going to prison type bombshells. Um, so we could have a situation very much like this, don't want no brush your teeth experiment. Uh, so in you know, looking at these theories, you have to look at all the results, you know, all their, to really understand their impact, you have to look at all the different studies they've done, in this case, experimental study, uh, to understand what what uh, what a hypothesis should, hypothesis should be? This is my hypothesis that the Democrats are in big trouble. If, they, if what they have so far from this very slanted, biased uh, House investigation of Trump, if that's if they don't have something a lot bigger than that, and so far they seem to have already talked to their best uh, had their best witnesses come forward, uh, then when this other stuff comes out, they are in big trouble by next November big trouble because people are going to feel betrayed, feel, feel lied to, and they may never vote Democrat again once they find out what the other, once they hear the other evidence. So, how many of you have, uh, uh, how many of you have seen my kind of video, not real video, but it's uh, it's audio over PowerPoint of Jim Polk, who was a uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter uh, for another Washington, D.C. paper, uh, who then went to work for NBC. You may remember that one. Um, I think it's important, uh, this concept I wrote in my thing here, medium is a message. It really is. Very, very powerful. And so until until 2016, the main source of political information uh, for Americans was TV. Newspapers had used to be the prime source. Um, I'm not sure where that crossed. Probably 1960, it crossed. That sounds reasonable. Probably 1960, it went from print to TV. And then, uh, as of uh, three years ago, it went to web. So now the main source of political information in America is the internet. So it's gone from print to TV to the, to the internet. And 
a lot of it has to do with, you know, what's the medium like? What, what are the pros and cons of that medium? What benefits does it have? What, uh, uh, as opposed to what detriments does it have? What, why do people suddenly go from newspaper to TV, from TV to, uh, to new media in their sourcing? Uh, this is an area of, you know, possible research, of past research, and possible still some research, uh, of, of what makes that, what causes that transition. Uh, we've seen the demographics. I've shown you some demographics that, in general, the young people, very few young people in the watch TV anymore. Uh, you know, from the youngest generation, you know, that's like your age generation in America, that they have TV past day, they don't watch TV. They, almost none of them read a newspaper. And so for the younger generation, it is all web um, or apps, but you know, digital anyway. Um, but with the, you know, the older gen my generation, the, the majority of my generation still going with TV, they, but they, I say they're used to it, but at some point in their life, they were, their first, their primary source of newspaper. That now it's TV. Uh, they are reluctantly edging more into the web. And the older generation, the younger generation, uh, uh, TV is never going to recapture the younger generation. Newspapers, forget it. Uh, newspapers are dead for the younger generation. I mentioned that the average, the average reader in the New York Times, I think, is 55. I believe that's the number as of a couple years ago. It's probably older than that now. So the average reader of the New York Times is likely to die in the next 20 years. Um, so even if the New York Times can survive 20 years, which is questionable, will they survive after that? If their average reader is going to be dead in 20 years, uh, yeah, we'll have, you know, that's, that's not a good, uh, that's not good information for your, for you to, uh, uh, you know, bet your future investments on um, because the especially considering the dramatic drop off this winter generation where they just went to you know five percent of the new so you know as the older generation dies off the winter generation is starting to watch a new thing they're not they're not gonna be enough support for a newspaper in twenty years. Um, I mean, I think most will die in 10 years because I, I don't, they're all losing money as it is. They've lost two thirds of their advertising or more at this point. Um, some of them are doing better than others. The New York Times seems to be doing better than, than uh, some of the others. Uh, the uh, National Union has a, a strong brand to back them up. Uh, but just the very nature uh, of the media uh, is affecting the question. And your audience is the one that determines the content. If the audience is saying print, print, ink, no, uh, print, you know, your audience TV, it's going to be really interesting. Um, audience web, and so the audience is the one determining the future. And why, are, you know, why are they responding that way? Why are they responding one way or the other to the different media? Um, you know, there there could be some some research in that area. Although it, it seems, well, it seems obvious. Has there been research? Has anybody actually asked the young people, you know, why? What? Well, why are you absolutely opposed to print? But why? Can you ever imagine yourself reading a newspaper? Why can't you possibly imagine yourself reading a newspaper? What, what is so terrible about a newspaper that you can't stand to read it? Um, is there any way, for example, uh, e-paper? You know, I've, I don't think I've shown it here, but there is e-paper now invented where your paper is digital. And so you have one, maybe a little bit thick sheet of paper that, that you can read your newspaper uh, do something to it, a new, a new page comes up, uh, would e-paper change their mind? I mean, it is digital, but it's paper, digital paper. It feels like paper. It is paper. It has some sort of 
coating or something on it that allows it to uh, to to show an image. Uh, allows you to save pages. Allows you to to uh, put them in social media. Uh, but it is e-paper. It is paper that has uh, is somehow able to transmit uh, uh, coating on it. Uh, we've seen in other videos uh, a piece of glass where on one side of the glass there's American kids and the other side of the glass are Indian kids and they're kind of talking to each other through this piece of glass because the glass itself has become digitized. It is glass but it has a digital film on it and so they're seeing each other through the glass like if they're in the next very next room. Well, so and the same thing like I say is, is happening with paper can prove 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 that because we paper cells would be paper. I don't know. What is before they can even think about it, before they invest in it, would the audience be something to be I don't know what the costs are. I mean I talked about how the subscription to the New York Times uh like they hate asking out of home deliver. In fact, that could be some research. Now, there's videos of e-paper, what it looked like. Um, would the younger younger generation respond to e, an e-paper publication? I don't know. I mean, you can actually have video on e-paper. It is, it is digital, so you can have video on e-paper. You certainly can have the other things. Then the the image on the e-paper changes to another page, to another page, to another page. It looks like a newspaper, but it's digital. Would the younger generation be willing to to read an e-paper? I don't know. Um, I don't know if anybody did any experiments on it yet. And I don't know what the cost would be for, for a publication to go to e-paper. Um, but, uh, I mean, actually it was uh, the, the Microsoft who has a video on it. I think it's Microsoft. And they thought by now e-paper would be common at publications, but it hasn't been. It hasn't become common. Why not? But why hasn't anybody tried it? Um, what would they have to do to... Uh, to, go, to move to e-paper. I don't know. Um, so we go back to Jim Polk. Um, he talked about the 2,000 pound pencil. So there's another aspect of the different media. The medium is the message. So what do you mean by a 2,000 pound pencil? But he went from, like I say, he was a, he was a, a a Pulitzer Prize winning print journalist, NBC came to him and said, hey, we'll pay you a bunch of money to come be our investigative reporter for NBC. Uh, and he uh, he agreed. He thought it'd be a good change in his life. And so he went from being an award-winning print journalist to an award-winning TV journalist. Given a good budget, they allowed him to you know do one story a week or something. Um, so he could uh, do a good job. In some cases, some of his stories probably took much longer than that. Um, but he, like most good journalists, had to had to work on more than one story at once. But he was probably able to put out only about one story a week uh, because of the in-depth nature of an investigative reporter. So what is, uh, he said, one of the big differences was the 2,000 pound pencil. What is the 2,000 pound pencil? And how does that affect reporting? And how could we study that? What is it? Um, is it worth studying? Or is it just a fact? And if you were to study the 2,000 pound pencil, what would exactly, what would be your method and what you would you be looking for? First off, what is it? What's your 2,000 pound pencil as a TV reporter? 
when he first mentioned that, I just thought of the big cam. Those days when he first, when I first interviewed him, um, last I noticed he was at CNN. He was NBC. Went to CNN. He may be retired. He's probably retired by now. He's somewhat older than I am, but I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, he's probably at least 10 older, 10 years older than me, so he's probably almost certainly retired. But he was still active 15 years ago, at least. I know that. Uh, 14 years ago. Um, so to him, the 2,000 pound pencil, you know, my thinking originally was you're talking about the size of the camera. Um, when he was, uh, when I interviewed him, the, the video cameras that TVs were using weren't 2,000 pounds, but they were big. Uh, you know, they're like, what, like 10 times as big as the current cameras, maybe not quite that, but more than five times, I'd say. So the cameras are big. There was no way that a reporter could use the camera by himself or herself while trying to report. At least it'd be very, very difficult. A lot of setup time, I guess, tripods, maybe, but it'd be difficult. Uh, our you know, our <coughs> quality cameras now are much smaller uh, than in the 1980s. And that is part of the 2,000 pound pencil. But what else? <clears throat> He says on his, uh, in his, his uh, interview that I conducted with him that part of it is, I mean, it's the cumbersome nature of TV news reporting is the way he, he said it. Not, the, not just the size of the equipment and so forth, but the cumbersome nature, nature. So if I remember right, uh, and we can watch the video if you wanted to, but uh, I, I think some of you have watched it, but Maybe you'd want to watch it again. One minute of video was about one hour of editing, something like that. It was, it was a, a large, a large amount. It might not have been quite that, but it almost seems like that's basically it was pretty close to what he's saying. For high quality network uh, editing, they were taking about an hour to edit uh, down to a minute. Part of that is how much video you take. Uh, and in his reporting, he told of one story in, in this video that I created where they did something like 14 hours of reporting. And their news story on TV was four minutes. You can see why that might take a lot of time per minute to edit. You had 14 hours of recording. That was probably more than an hour per minute, considering that. Um, but that's, that was probably his worst case scenario. He traveled back and forth uh, between Washington and San Francisco. He um, you know, interviewed uh, you know, people in both places in between. Uh, might take them, in some cases, took them you know, several hours. In fact, I, I, when he says 14 hours, I don't think he's counting this plane ride. I don't think but that would have added up a lot more so i don't think he's counting his, his plane ride and it was just not it wasn't just him by himself so he had uh, at least uh, at least one other person with him uh when he was doing this interviewing of, of in this case about uh people from el salvador who had entered the u.s illegally um anyway so he had many i think he had 18 out 14 hours of interview not counting his travel time that they had ended down to four minutes um, he had an interview, like a three-hour three, three hour interview with somebody, and it was six seconds, something like that. Just, you know, crazy stuff. Um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're dealing at this level of reporting uh, for a, a, a national news medium. So that to him was the, the 2,000 pound pencil, just how, how much work you could do or couldn't do in order to uh, get the job done. Um, a couple we've talked about a few other things uh, like selecting sources we just talked about that earlier today um, in in the uh, uh, the gatekeeping is part of it partly it's the uh, I mean all the things of bias re relate to to your selecting sources uh, do you ha select too many of one side than the other uh, when you report on what they say? Uh, what words do you write down? 
Uh, what are the, you know, what's the impact of the words themselves? Uh, how do you frame the interview? Um, as you write the story, do you bury the evidence from one side and highlight it for the other side? Uh, there's so many different ways that you can bias a story um, and the selection of sources is one of them. The selection of what you use from a source is one of them. Uh, the uh, use of uh, words as you, uh, especially as you use indirect quotes or paraphrases about the interview. Even if you have accurate direct quotes, uh, will you still, will you accurately reflect that person? Will you frame it accurately? Um, with all of the other words, with your paraphrases, with your indirect quotes, with the, the organization of your of your story, and so forth. Um, so that goes into the framing, but also there's the sources themselves can frame your story for you. So we we're talking about an unbiased or an un, uneven selection of, of sources uh, is a problem, but it's not just the number of sources. How do those sources frame your story? Uh, if you're if you're if you have an uneven number, if you have three, again staying with politics, but does, not necessarily politics about any subject. But if in politics you have three so-called liberal sources and two conservative sources, uh, there's just more of a chance that those the influence of those people. Even if you're totally unbiased yourself, you're totally unbiased, and you have three people frame helping you frame your story by the, their testimony and by their orientation, they're helping you frame it. This is what's important about this story. And you have two people over here helping you frame the story, trying to convince you that their frame is more accurate. Um, and so if you have any biases at all, it's going to be even magnified if you, have, if you chose more sources that agreed with you than sources that disagreed with you. It's by its very nature. Because you have them, they're telling you what the frame is. Your sources are telling you the frame. Right now, the stuff with Trump, the Democrats are telling the, the liberal media, this is the frame that we're going with. Today, we're talking now about bribery. And so they're telling the liberal media, this is all about bribery. Donald Trump bribed, uh, all his sources bribed the president of Ukraine to give that dirt on the Biden. It was basically the frame they're trying to set up in their latest effort. And they are talking to enough of, of these Democrat lawmakers and stuff, they're buying into that frame. That is the frame that the media is telling uh, is the frame media in America right now, is that it is bribery. Uh, but that's the Democrats' frame. Those sources gave them the frame. And they're, they're, they're reporting that frame. They've accepted that frame. Well, um, we're going to have a quiz flash activity now to finish the class. You can have as many people on your team as you want to. They can be your team from your first project, or they can be other people. I don't care. You get to cheat on this activity. You get to cheat on this quiz. You can do anything you want to. No holds barred. You can cheat as much as you want um, because it's... There are some hard questions. You're going to have to work with each other, or it will help you to work with some people. And if you have too many people on your team, it may be worse. But I don't know. I don't care. You may be better off doing it by yourself. I don't. But you can do anything you want to. You can cheat as much as you want in this activity. Um, so, stop that.